I think it's totally possible to have a, a totally autonomous robo taxi service in 2025, 2026, but people need to be testing on edge cases. All right, we'll start with the most difficult thing. Tell me who you are and what you do. Uh, all right, so I am Chess Stetson. Um, I have a back background in computational neuroscience, and I am the CEO of D-Risk. And what we do is train and test and then retrain self-driving cars on edge cases. All the hard, uh, unusual things that can happen on the road, which individually are unlikely, but together make up all of the risk. So when you get in a traffic accident, it's not because you're doing something totally normal, it's because something unusual happened. And even that, though that unusual thing is very, very unlikely, all the unusual things together, those are the things we need to get self-driving cars to get good at. And you, you, know, you spoke earlier about, um, talk to me about the difference between solving this outside in versus inside out. So if you were talking with pretty much any engineer over a pint, that engineer would agree with you that the thing with any engineering problem is to solve for the edge cases, for the things that happen on the boundary, the hardest stuff, and then you usually get the easy stuff for free. Another way I might put it is, if you can learn to thread a needle, then it's really easy to thread a basketball hoop, but not vice versa. And so if we had a principle for getting a self-driving car to solve everything that was hard, unprotected lefts, oncoming vehicles, T-bones, times when people are wearing unusual camouflage, we, we solve for all of those things, then it would be easy to also solve for just driving down a straight road with two lines behind uh, on either side, um, uh, you know, taking uh, protected turns. The problem is that self-driving car companies have generally been incentivized to do the easiest stuff first, they have gotten it so that they, it seems very impressive when you get a car to just stay between the lanes because it feels like, wow, like it's, uh, it's just like we do as humans. But you, you as a human don't then remember that it's so, uh, so difficult to repeat everything that a human already takes for granted. All the millions of years of evolution that have, that have allowed us to be able to avoid oncoming vehicles because it's this big scary thing that's coming at you, the self-driving car doesn't have that intuition. So when it solves for a center case, you can't be sure it can solve for the edge case. So how are current driverless car companies, how are they approaching this problem? What's, what's their current solution versus what D-Risk is doing? Now they all know they need to solve for the edge cases, but their development trajectory started with the easy stuff and then getting, got more and more complex. So now you can do something very, very different where you can, if you could catalog everything that could go wrong, you can actually simulate it and then train the self-driving car to handle all of it at once. And then you don't have to go in that stepwise way. And more importantly, you don't endanger people on the road when something unusual happens. How do you define the limits and the parameters of everything that could go wrong without going into the weird and wonderful surrealist world of elephants falling out of the sky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Well, in principle, we allow for that. So we don't draw the line anywhere. We certainly have meteor strikes sitting inside of the knowledge graph. <laughs> Um, and people will often bring that up as like, well, do you have to solve for that? You actually kind of do, because a meteor strike will often have a bright flash that happens in the atmosphere, and you need to make sure that your computer vision doesn't misinterpret that as something else. Yeah. So um, we don't draw the line at any particular phenomenology. If you, if you have a particular simulator, it'll, it'll have to only simulate certain things, right? So Grand Theft Auto can simulate an, an, an set of things, but it might not be able to do the meteor. Yeah. What we do is first catalog everything that can happen. And we do that by taking data from all the sources that can tell us about real life accidents and about what goes wrong with autonomous vehicles and, and, and AI. We put them in one massive catalog, which is called a knowledge graph for us. Something, a data structure that's so flexible that it can capture just about anything that can happen, even if it happens only in schematic form. And then we pipe those into simulation picking always the things that most canvas the landscape of everything that can go wrong in such a way that you can train the autonomous vehicle and then test it later with an independent set. And that is the, the, the whole flow that you need in order to be able to capture all that weird stuff and make sure that AV can handle it. So what kind of data sources are you capturing then, you mentioned? So some of the big ones are camera data and uh, accident reports. 
The camera data comes from things like uh, the good old jam cams here in London. London's highly sensorized, and we've been aggregating that data for years, um, I think more than any other company. We also have uh, uh, static CCTV cameras in the US, traffic recording cameras, and then of course front-facing cameras from a bunch of different sources. And we focus on places where accidents actually tend to happen. We just focus on cameras that are looking at intersections, on-ramps, off-ramps, a bunch of places where we know risky stuff is gonna happen. Lo and behold, we got a lot of that risky stuff. Then we use computer vision, suck it in, uh, and then retrain the self-driving cars to handle all that risky stuff. I mean, how much data have you gathered in terms of like terabytes? Like right. it must be huge. Well, I put it in terms of the under, some of the underlying data types sometimes. So we have roughly a million hours of camera data from a variety of locations, mostly static CCTV pointing at higher risk or, or interesting intersections. Uh, we've got hundreds of thousands of accident reports, including a huge amount of full text accident reporting. We have um, thousands of those uh, reports that we got from individual contributors that were telling us about you know, what they'd advise their kids to avoid uh, and what they think is going to be hard for self-driving cars. Um, we have insurance reports uh, that tell us about collisions that might never have been reported uh, in, in a, an official police statement. So that's, that's a rough scope of what, what it is. But then it all needs to get translated into this, this place where the statistics change again. Um, uh, many of the uh, hours of camera footage record exactly the same thing as all the other hours, no, but a bunch of boring driving. And so we all have to, we have to translate it into this, this manifold or this landscape. So I'm a driverless car company and I come to de-risk. How does the process work? We start by giving you maybe a thousand of the riskiest edge cases over the whole span of the, of the landscape of edge cases. Now, usually we'll start with things that are easy for you to simulate. So vehicles and some pedestrians. Then when you get good at those, then they can start running many more of them. And then they'll also get more esoteric things. They'll get the bikes and the scooters. Um, uh, they'll get the unusual events, uh, certainly boxes and other kinds of objects falling off the back of vehicles. And that takes them out to many thousands more. And we believe that the, the end game of this is to get self-driving car companies into at least the hundreds of millions of scenarios, but the number is not as important as the distribution. They need to get out to, as I might say, six sigma of the events. Yep. So if humans deal with four or five sigma of the events, we expect self-driving car companies to deal with just a bit more yep. uh, because they should be held to a higher standard. And when we talk about the events and the knowledge graph, could you just talk to me a little bit about how those, each of those crashes and incidents are catalogued and categorized? Right. So the self-driving car simulation environment is kind of like 3D, right? But the actual space of everything that go wrong is many, many, many more dimensions than that. You can't just imagine that uh, just dealing with things that move in X, Y, and Z is enough because, of course, there can be all sorts of arrangements of those things, and those are like more dimensions. Um, which ones tend to be coming at you versus which ones are just going to pass you? Those are actually characterized by dimensions for us. Um, what the vehicles are, what, what kinds of different objects you can be looking at, um, potentially even human intentions. Those are all dimensions for us, and you put all those dimensions together and you have at least a thousand dimensional space, yeah. and, and depending on how we do it, much more than that. That ends up going to this thing that I've been telling you about, this knowledge graph, and it's, it's like a hyper-dimensional space that you can then probe to find the stuff you're most interested in testing on. So if I wanted to go out and drive on the road, I have to get a provisional license that says I am testing myself and I'm learning, and then I have to pass a driving test, and then I get permission to drive on the roads. Is there that driving test for driverless cars at the moment? Right. No. You'd think there would be. Um, the problem is twofold. One, the way you test an AI should be completely different than the way you test a regular AI, a non-AI. Um, with a human, you go and you do your driving test, and when the driving instructor sees that you can do parallel parking with traffic going by, he knows that if the traffic were coming the other direction, you'd be just as able to avoid it because you've got this brain that doesn't like to get hit by things. It's been evolving for millions of years, well, more than that, depending on how you count, to, to not get hit by things and not to hit things. Yeah. Self-driving cars don't have that. They just match patterns in a very sophisticated way. 
but you can't be sure at all that if a self-driving car knows how to do an unprotected left turn uh, while avoiding the gap in traffic, that it, you know, weaving its way through the gap in traffic, that it's going to be able to do the same thing uh, coming out of a, a, a residential street onto a highway if it's been doing it at a junction on two highways. So, um, and, the, and again, the reason for that is because it's matched a pattern of what it's supposed to do, and that pattern may not translate to another scenario. AI isn't good at generalizing. So what to, a real self-driving car driver's test would be one that really just tests the self-driving car on everything that can happen, completely unlike a regular driving's test because there's not enough time for it. But there is, one, if you can simulate, and, and, and two, if you can do it massively in parallel. You still have to test on the right stuff, but there's a lot more capacity for testing. Then the other really important thing is, the test has to be something that's completely out of sample. You can tell a self-driving car company the kinds of things that you want to test on, but if you give it exact tests that it needs to pass, it'll just, it'll just learn to do those things. Yeah. Now, the question is, how safe? If I have a driving test, I'm allowed to have some minors. I don't think anybody's convincingly answered that question yet. Yeah. Our company is going to be coming out with what we would call a Sigma score um, in a few months here. And uh, the way it works is if you can map out everything that's going to go wrong, you start with the relatively more common things in the center, and then you actually move throughout that map. And as you go throughout that map, you get further and further from the center, and you're collecting more and more things uh, in the same way that we talk about a bell curve in statistics. As you get out to two sigma, you've handled 95% of the uh, things. Three sigma is 99%. We think humans are somewhere between four and five sigma, and a self-driving car should be six sigma. And that is roughly what we think that should be the bar. And so that would, that would be how you know when you're safe. Can, can this do everything? Is there a world in which an autonomous driving company would never need to test their vehicles on open roads? Or is there always a limit? I think that is exactly the premise, that you shouldn't need to test in an open road when you deploy it because you should be so confident in its behavior. Mm. I think that the idea that we've been hearing from self-driving car companies for many generations that, <laughs> of these technologies now, that they're collecting more data by driving in real life and then that's going to make them better is a little bit nuts. But then again, by the time you get to a high level performance, perhaps a little bit of testing on the open road should be like the final veneer, like the mm. icing on the cake, the top of the creme brulee. What needs to happen before that is that you should see self-driving car companies in some sort of controlled environment doing huge gauntlets of tests. And they, they should still, in real life tests, they should still be out of sample. There should be things that a testing authority set up that they couldn't predict. But even there, they're gonna have some kind of idea because it's gotta be practically set up. It's gonna be a pedestrian dummy or something like that. They're never gonna have to deal with that. So really most of the confidence needs to come in simulation beforehand, yeah. Obviously, what we're talking about here is a vision-based learning system. Now, a lot of the driverless car companies are also deploying LiDAR. Um, does LiDAR not just solve this problem? It, I, I don't think they're so different. Um, LiDAR needs to be able to handle edge cases just like computer vision does. Now, they're, they're slightly different for some things in the LiDAR domain. LiDAR is going to have trouble handling a bunch of pipes pointing out at you, you know, and the laser's pointing down the pipes, so it's not going to see the face. It's just going to you know, have a very minimal signature there. Or the classic one is like a hurricane fence that it can't actually see, but it could run into. Um, the LiDAR needs to be able to handle that just like computer vision needs to be able to handle uh, you know, a gray clad pedestrian in a gray background. They, so they have different edge cases, but they, they both have edge cases that are specific to the sensor modality. And then they both have this massive problem of if somebody is about to walk out from behind an occlusion and there's a small amount of time in which to integrate the information, you need to be able to handle that no matter what. Yeah. So it, really having, solving the problem of common sense is not specific to a particular sensor modality. LiDAR is great because just like a garage door sensor, if there's a physical thing there, it can make you stop. Yeah. But you need to anticipate whether that physical thing is going to be there. And that's a huge part of the problem that you can't get around with any one particular sensor. Nice. So what is the road ahead? Pun entirely not intended, but it's there anyway. It what is, <laughs> what is, what's the next plans for de-risk? Um, our goal is to try to get the initial set of scenarios that we think are the best representation of the, the first thousand or, or so odd high-risk scenarios out to basically every AV developer. And then I think we will already start to see improvements in, in the life cycle and in the, in the, in the trajectory of autonomous vehicles that we haven't seen yet. I think it's totally possible to have a, a totally autonomous robo-taxi service in 2025, 2026. 
but people need to be testing on edge cases. Chase, thank you. I'll shake your hand. Thank you very much. Pleasure.